Shavua Tov, loved ones, and welcome, welcome, welcome. We've joined together for another week to give thanks to our Lord, to prepare for the week ahead, give him our worship, receive any prophetic words he has for us, um, show him love, and to go over the word of God together. Today, we're going to look at Genesis 9, and also we're going to read the book of Philemon. We're going to start adding in the New Testament so we can cover more ground as we go through the written word of God each week. Um, I want to thank you so much for being here with me each week. I appreciate you. It's so funny. I was saying, um, well, the Lord invited me to do this. He said, I'd like you to do something consistently each week. And so I said, yes, I will. I, I will do this. I love to read the word. I don't know what else to do um, other than read the word. So I was laughing last week and sharing with Patty Cake. I was like, I, I am so surprised that people are actually sitting there listening to me read the word of God. It's it's really interesting that people are willing to do that. But thank the Lord. I praise God that you're hungry for the word, that you um, love the word, that you are getting something out of it, that you're spending more time in the word personally, and then um, allowing Holy Spirit to show you some things that you may not have seen before. You have to remember the word of God is full of mysteries. It's so complex and so complicated, but you have Holy Spirit who is your teacher and who is the one who will lead and guide you into all truth right there with you, teaching you and sharing with you everything that you need to know so that you can come into full understanding of the word and then have it manifesting in your life. Because if you fall in love with the word, remember you're falling in love with Yeshua because he's the word made flesh. And then you're going to begin to live by the word, speak the word, agree with the word, and all of that will be manifesting in your life. So thank you so much for sitting with me. I want to remind you to visit us at www.1123.life. If you have not partnered with us yet, I invite you to do that as well. We are a fertile ministry. We have a lot of wonderful things connected to our ministry, anointings, um, blessings, angels, all those things that you become, um, you gain access to when you partner with us. So definitely consider doing that. All right, loved ones. So let's go ahead and just lift up Jesus. There are some things that I want to cover today and make some strong decrees over and pray over, um, you know, the war and everything that's going on over in Europe between Russia and Ukraine and all of their allies and all of the things. There's lots of stuff going on there behind the scenes. So don't just make any assumptions about Russia being the big bad bear. You know, if you are somebody who looks at the prophecies and the words that come out, if you're somebody who has good discernment and sight and who's willing to ask the Lord what's going on, you know, when the, the news media is presenting you something, then you're going to have a fuller picture of that. And, um, you know, just because of the history of Russia and their desires and the things that they want to do and then who their allies are, you always have to know that when there's some type of fight going on but with Russia that, you know, generally there are multiple reasons that it's happening. And so we want to pray God's will over the Russian Ukraine situation and also over the United States because we are heavily involved in that. You know, war is unnecessary because we know this because we just had a president who didn't bring us into any wars for four years. And now here we are, different president, and we're going back to the same type of foolishness that our nation was in before Trump was in office. Okay, so we want to pray God's will. And the easiest way to pray God's will, Jesus taught us how to do that. You declare that um, God's will be done on earth in that situation as it is in heaven. And then angels hear that because you've come into agreement with the word of God and they go out and do what they're supposed to do. So Father, we just come before you at the ecclesia here celebrating and join together in your name. We bless the Ukrainian church. We bless the Russian church. We know that you have prophetic words over both of those churches. And we just come into agreement with those words that the church is going to be protected and that it's going to rise up. And we also declare that your will be done as far as the conflict is concerned for Russia, for Ukraine. Um, Iran has something to do with it. And then also United States and the things that our president and his son have um, gotten involved with with Ukraine. And then we also ask for your will to be done with the Pentagon's um, bio labs that are in Ukraine as well that belong to our nation. So see, saints, there's so much going on. You want to be praying God's will and not just praying what you think or what the media is saying and things like that. You want to pray God's will and you know how to do that. You declare God's will be done on earth in Ukraine, in Russia, Iran, um, with the Russian church, with the Ukrainian church, as it is in heaven, on earth, in these situations right now. So we commission and loose angels to go and to perform the will of God in those situations. And Father, we thank you for your angel armies. We thank you that you know everything that's going on. You know the ins and outs. You know what's going on behind the scenes. 
you know who's lying and who's telling the truth, and you are a God who will protect your church. We just come into agreement for the Ukrainian and Russian churches that um, no weapon formed against them prospers and they will refute every tongue that rises against them in judgment. And we also just declare that they have authority over all the power of the enemy, authority over all of the power of the enemy, and nothing will by any means hurt them. We thank you, Lord, for your prophets and for your prophetic words. We praise you because you said that you don't do anything without telling your friends the prophets. And we appreciate that heads up. We thank you so much for preparing us for everything. We thank you so much for equipping us with everything. And we just declare and loose the blood of Jesus into all of Europe right now, into the Russian church, into the Ukrainian church, over Vladimir Putin, over Zelensky, over the Iranian regime, and of course, over our president and um, our Congress and all of that right now in Jesus' name. We thank you and we praise you, Heavenly Father, that angels are doing work behind the scenes that we cannot see when we pray correctly. And I just declare over the body of Christ in the United States that we will step it up in our discernment and stop believing the, the mainstream media and everything that they put out. Start looking at what the Lord is speaking through his prophets. Start coming into agreement with the word of the Lord, releasing it and decreeing it. I thank you and I praise you for that. You are great and greatly to be praised, Lord. That's something about agreeing with prophetic words, right? When the prophetic word is released, it's not automatic. Just like the blessings in the Bible aren't automatic, you actually have to come into agreement with those things and begin to decree them. And you have to get to a place in faith where you believe those words, right? You know, there's so many things that the Lord has said about this nation, about our personal lives, but we have to actually come into agreement with him and speak those things out, you know, into the atmosphere and build faith for them so that they can actually manifest. And, you know, the, as far as time goes, there it doesn't have to take a long time. I was been sharing recently, I prayed a prayer request on February 16th, completely forgot about it. The Lord sent me an angel that said, yes, the Lord says you can have this on February 22nd. And then I was like, oh, that's kind of big. I don't know if I want that. And then when I was going back, looking in my journal, my prayer journal, I was like, oh, I asked the Lord for this. And now here I am being a chicken and don't want to receive it. You want to be sure that if your faith um, is going in the right direction, you don't have to worry about time. Things are going to happen and it doesn't have to take forever. I'm a witness of this. All right. So let's go ahead and worship the Lord and give him thanks and praise for everything he's doing. Lord, we just honor you. We glorify you. We worship you and we bless you. We magnify you and we exalt you. You are great and greatly to be praised. Great and greatly to be praised. We honor you. We honor you. We honor you, Jesus. We bless you. We love you. We thank you for your ministering spirits that are ministering spirits sent to serve us because we are heirs to salvation. We thank you for the angels that are assigned to the Ukrainian and Russian churches. And we speak to those angels and we lose and commission any additional angels from our nation who are free to go right now and join with them in the warfare that's going on so that those churches can be preserved and so that awakening can come and they can rise up in authority and begin to legislate on earth and in the heavenlies what should be happening in their regions, in their nations in their countries, in their continents. We just thank you and praise you for the authority that you've given us, Lord. We magnify you for making us your governing body here on earth. We repent for the church of Christ in the United States who has been afraid to engage in politics fully. We repent of um, failing to engage in the educational system so that all of these uh, young people are coming up brainwashed, Lord. We repent of that. And we say right now, we're going to begin to partner with your angels in a new way to change this nation, to take it back, because this is a nation that believes in God. This is a nation that believes in Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We give you praise. We give you honor. We give you glory. All right, loved ones, let's go ahead and jump into Genesis 9. All righty. Let's see. God blessed Noah and his sons, and he said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the land. The fear and terror of you will be on every wild animal and on every flying creature of the sky, with everything that crawls on the ground and with all the fish of the sea into your hand, they are given. Okay, so this is something that you need to meditate on, saints. God blessed Noah and his sons, and he said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the land. So basically, he's reiterating the blessing that was released to um, Adam and Eve in Genesis 1.27. Okay, this is what we're supposed to be doing here. Or is it 227? One of those. So this is for you. This is for you. This blessing that no one his sons received, it's for you. It's being repeated. And if we focus on the blessing, look at that. So the curse is mentioned one time, you know, Genesis 3, right? And how many times has the Lord said, I bless you, I bless you, I bless you? Multiple times between Genesis 1 and Genesis 9. So that's telling us 
that our focus as believers should be on the blessing and stop focusing so much on the curse. Do you understand that? The, the blessing is mentioned probably like 12 times in these first nine chapters and the curse is mentioned once, maybe three times. So it still outweighs it, right? It still outweighs, the blessing outweighs the curse one to four, right? So 25% of time potentially spoken about the curse, 75% of the time Lord's spoken, speaking about the blessing. So what should you be focused on as a believer in Messiah Yeshua? You should be focused on the blessing 70% of the time and then overturning the curse, you know, that last 25% of the time, but not fretting on, you know, the toll that it takes in your life and in your nation and in your family and all of that stuff. Focus on the blessing. Whatever you magnify in your life, you're sowing as seed. So if you are magnifying and um, sowing seeds of the curse, why do you expect to be prosperous? Why do you expect to be fruitful? Think, all right? The fear of the Lord and terror will be on every wild animal and on every flying creature in the sky of everything that crawls on the ground and with all deficiency into your hand they are given. Okay, so you have dominion over animals and things. Why are you afraid of spiders, snakes, anything? You have dominion over those things. And if you have dominion over them, if they've been given into your hand, if something an animal is doing is not to your liking, you speak to it and correct it. You have authority over them. You have dominion over them. The Lord is repeating what he repeated to Adam and Eve already at the beginning of the book. Every crawling thing that is alive will be food for you, as are the green plants. I have now given you everything. Do you hear this? I have given you everything. I have given you everything. Do you hear that? I have given you everything. And then this is repeated, this statement that all things are, are have been given into Jesus' hand and you're co-heir with Christ. This is repeated in the New Testament right? So the Lord has been telling you forever that you are never, ever, 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 ever supposed to be without. You are never, ever, ever supposed to be um, under somebody else's subjection. You know, you're supposed to be walking in dominion and reigning. He's been saying this from the beginning, right? If you read the Bible the way it's intended for you to read it, saints, you would have a whole different life going on right now, right? I have now given you everything. He has given you everything. And everything doesn't just mean the plants and the animals, right? He says, I have now given you everything. Everything is all inclusive. Inclusive. Think about this one. With faith, everything's possible for you. Well, what does everything mean? All things. I have now given you everything. You need to meditate on that and soak it up and believe it. Live it out. Only flesh with its life, that is its blood, you must not eat. Surely your lifeblood will I avenge. So basically you're not supposed to be eating people and you're supposed to make sure that um, the raw meat that you eat gets cooked so that there's no blood in it. You're supposed to strain out the blood and not eat that. You know there are uh, satanic worshipers out there who are consuming blood and stuff and they're pulling in power from that. Why? Because life is in the blood. They're pulling in demonic power by doing things like that. Another way that they... Um, that they do that is through abortion. You know, you're shedding blood, innocent blood, and you're pulling in power from that. Verse five, surely your lifeblood I will avenge. From every animal and from every person will I avenge it. From every person's brother will I avenge that person's life. Okay, this is kind of the reason that I brought up abortion here because listen to what this says. From every person's brother will I avenge that person's life. So, you know, we have places in the United States, it used to be in Los Angeles, California, it used to be called Killa Cali, remember? And then, um, Washington, D.C., Baltimore, Atlanta, Chicago, where there's lots of black on black crime, lots of murder and all that stuff going on. And we have African-Americans have the highest abortion rate in the United States. And it shouldn't be that way. Like we are the we are the ethnicity that have the most abortions. Why? Well, it's partly because um, that was the plan of Margaret Sanger, the founder of Planned Parenthood, who was a eugenicist. You know, she was a Satanist. She was somebody who wanted to uh, you know, she was a little bit like Hitler, if you if you want to know the truth. She was somebody who wanted to kill, you know, most black people. You know, there were like a few that she would have saved that would have been, you know, quote unquote, you know, super intelligent and stuff like that. But for the rest of them, they wanted to completely eliminate them from the face of the earth. So you have that going on. And so they target African-American neighborhoods, right? They target poor neighborhoods, you know, and then they try to tell you, oh, well, you can't take care of the kid and this is your choice and blah, 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 all the time while they're, you know, demons standing by their shoulders saying, you know, say this, say this, say this. And they're doing that to convince people to, to abort their children. Well, the thing is, is that there has to be vengeance for blood that's shed. And so until African-Americans cut down on that 
you know, that level, that high percentage of abortions than those murders in places like Chicago and Atlanta and Washington, D.C., Baltimore, stuff like that, they're not going to stop because you reap what you sow. And, you know, people always love to identify by races and stuff, you know, Black power and all that stuff. Well, Black power isn't in killing each other, you know, so it's like you have to decide, are you are you really for Black power and for Black people? Or are you, you know, it's like, well, you know, sometimes murdering is okay and sometimes it's not. It just depends on who's doing it. You know, come on now, we got to think about that and, and grow up. All right. The one who sheds human blood by a human, will his blood be shed? For in God's image, he made humanity. And I was just explaining that to you. When abortion is high between Black people, uh, murder between Black people is going to be high as well. Because um, a mother, a Black mother killing a Black child, even if it's only a half Black child, a partial Black child, whatever, that still is going to be avenged. The Lord set this in place from the beginning, and there's no way we can get away from that. And we have to, as believers, start taking that... Um, abortion battle spiritually as opposed to naturally, you know, and trying to say it's the woman's choice and blah, 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 and all this stuff. And it doesn't have anything to do with, um, you know, Chicago being full of murders. Yes, it does. The Bible tells us that right here. He said specifically, he said right here, for every person's brother, will I avenge that person's life? Do you understand that? So even if you're not related to anybody in Chicago, but you're a black person participating in abortion, you are facil facilitating and multiplying out that murderous spirit right? You're serving that murderous spirit and it's going to multiply because that's what happens when you sow seed. Verse seven, but as for you, be fruitful, multiply, flourish in the land and multiply in it. So the Lord is telling you right here, don't be involved in murder, be fruitful and multiply. You're supposed to be increasing, not taking away. Then God said to Noah unto his sons with him saying, now I, behold, I am about to establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you. So again, he's establishing the covenant and the covenant gets us everything. The covenant is the, you know, the signed in blood and it gives us everything that we need. Everything that we need. Remember what did the Lord say a few verses up? I have given you everything, everything. And it's because of covenant. And with every living creature that is with you, including the flying creatures, the livestock and every wild animal with you, of all that is coming out of the ark, every animal of the earth, I will confirm my covenant with you. Never again will all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood and never again will there be a flood to ruin the land. All right. If you are in a, a place that is subjective to flood, you can take the scripture right here and never again will there be a flood to ruin the land. And you can declare that over your land, over your property, over your city, and the floods will stop. They will not come up on your property. They will not come up on the line that you draw. I can guarantee it. You know why? Because the word does not return void. Then God said, this is a sign of the covenant that I am making between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. My rainbow do I place in the cloud and I will be, it will be a sign of the covenant between me and the land. Whenever I bring clouds over the land and the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every loving creature of all flesh. Never again will the waters become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the rainbow is in the cloud, I will look at it to remember the perpetual covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the land. Then God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have confirmed between me and all flesh that is on the land. All right, loved ones, don't be afraid of the rainbow. That is God's rainbow. It belongs to him. It does not belong to anybody else. And it sure doesn't belong to any man-made organization. Okay, that is the Lord's. And it's a reminder of covenant. It's a reminder of covenant. You know, the enemy likes to pervert things. That's what they do. Everything that the Lord does, because they can't create Everything that the Lord does, they have to distort it in some way to make it seem like it's a bad thing and to um, encourage sin and all that stuff. But the the rainbow in the sky, like they can't bring that into existence. You know, they can't take that out of the sky. That belongs to God. It doesn't matter what the enemy says. He can't put a rainbow in the sky. He doesn't have the capability to do that. Right. Not a natural one. He can't do it. You know, so there he's trying to do everything he can to take away um, you know, our ability and reasoning to remember what the Lord has done with the rainbow and what the Lord is saying with the rainbow and then try to put a negative spin on it. We don't fall for that foolishness. We know that our God is the only one who owns the rainbow. All right. And if he owns it, we own it. Say, so we can take that back. We can actually pull that out of that organization and take it back for the kingdom of God, because that's the type of authority that we have. But even if we do, don't do that, still don't be afraid of the rainbow. Don't be afraid to use the rainbow. That is from God. You know, God is light and rainbow is a reflection of light. All those colors and everything that are in the rainbow, they all come from him. 
right? The enemy tries to pose as light sometimes, but they are not real light. Verse 18, Noah's sons who came out from the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were Noah's sons, and from these the whole earth dispersed. Then Noah, a man of the soil, so here he is, he's a farmer, so he's really going to get sowing and reaping down, was first to plant a vineyard. He drank some of the wine, got drunk, and was uncovered in his tent. Then Ham, Canaan's father, father, saw his father's private parts and told his two brothers outside. So Shem and Japheth took the cloak and laid it over both their shoulders and walked backwards and with it covered their father's private parts. But their faces were turned away so that they did not see their father's private parts. When Noah woke up from his wine, he learned what his youngest son had done to him. So he said, cursed is Canaan, the lowest slave will be he, he to his brothers. Okay, so interesting things here. First of all, this is why you don't need to get drunk, right? You just don't need to. Um, things happen that you don't intend to happen. Negative things happen, you know, when you when you're drinking and drunk, right? So just be wise. And if it's something that you're susceptible to, you know, alcoholism, something like that, then stay completely stay away from it, right? When Noah woke up from his wine, he learned what his youngest son had done to him. So he said, cursed is Canaan, the lowest slave will be he to his brothers. So he cursed his grandson first, right? He cursed his grandson. He also said, blessed be Adonai, God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth. May he dwell in the tents of Shem and may Canaan be his slave. He cursed his um, son's future generations. He cursed where his son was going. He cursed his son's future. Can you believe that? So in this instance, I suppose it was justified because what he did was completely wrong. But Think about that when you're speaking to your children. Are you releasing curses over them and their future? Or are you releasing blessing? You know, the power of life and death is in the tongue. And whatever you release is going to feed your life. It's going to come into your existence. All right. But if you look a few chapters forward in the Bible, you see all this strife and all kind of negative things, slavery and all this stuff in Canaan. Why? Because of this curse right here. Because of this curse right here. So just spend some time. Thinking over that, you know, thinking about the consequences of this curse and how far it goes into the future of humanity. There's still so much turmoil over there in the Middle East, partly because the Israel is there, you know, God's chosen people are there, his first people are there, and then partly because of all of these things that have happened in the Bible. Verse 28, now Noah lived 350 years after the flood, so all Noah's days were 950 years, then he died. Definitely spend some time reading through Genesis 9 on your own, speaking with Holy Spirit, allowing him to show you anything that is hidden in there that will be a blessing to your life, that will help you. Remember, the Bible says that godliness is profitable for all things. So if you find something, you know, a mystery, discover a mystery in Genesis 9, you can turn that into a million dollar product, right? That's how our God is. Let's go ahead and read Philemon. We're going to jump over to the New Testament today. So, Father, we just bless you for this word. and We thank you and we praise you for it. All right, let's jump over to Philemon. We're going to start going through the New Testament and seeing how so many things in the Old Testament fit together with the New Testament and give us a fuller picture of how we're supposed to live in victory. Philemon 1. Paul, a prisoner of Messiah Yeshua and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved and fellow worker, to Aphia, our sister, to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the ecclesia that meets in your house. Grace to you and shalom from God our Father and the Lord Messiah Yeshua. I thank my God always when mentioning you in my prayers, hearing of your love and the trust you have toward the Lord Yeshua and all the Kedoshim. That's the saints, the holy ones. And I do this too. Like I am always thanking God for like Kenneth Hagin and Oral Roberts and all the people that I've learned for from and been mentored by. Such an amazing, amazing blessing to have those people who are loving the Lord and pour into your life. Verse six, may the fellowship of your faith become effective with the recognition of all the good that is ours in Messiah. Do you see that? May your faith become effective. The fellowship of your faith, the gathering of your faith, the celebration of your faith become effective with the recognition of all the good that is ours in Messiah. You have so much good because of Jesus saints. You should be living your best life. Remember, Holy Spirit said you've got enough to live the best year of your life. So make this the best year of your life. All of this good that we have through Messiah, we have so much. And I hope you're picking up on all of these good things as we go through the word together. 
Verse seven, for I have received much joy and comfort in your love, brother, because of the hearts of the Kedoshim, Kedoshim have been refreshed through you. So Philemon is serving the body and teaching the body, mentoring the body, and Paul is being blessed by that. He had a special relationship with Philemon when they were together in the same location, and he's seeing the fruit of that, and it's a blessing. So that's just like, if you learn anything from me and you go and put that in your place, that's a tremendous blessing also to see you, you know, making spiritual grandchildren for me and all of that stuff because you are um, taking what you've learned, any revelation that I've shared with you and putting it into practice. Praise God for that. All right. Verse eight, therefore, I have plenty of boldness in Messiah in order to, to it. I have, therefore, though I have plenty of boldness in Messiah to order you to do what's right, yet for love's sake, I appeal to you instead. So what he's saying is because I mentored you, I have um, the authority in Yeshua to order you to make the decision that I would like you to make. But instead, because I love you, I'm asking you to do this. All right. This teaches us how to deal with people who are, you know, under our authority. Good lesson there. I, Paul, am an old man and now also a prisoner belonging to Messiah Yeshua. I beg you for my child Onesimus, for whom I became a spiritual father while in chains. So while he's in uh, Rome and he's in chains and living in his own house, right? Um, Onesimus came to him and he began to mentor him in the faith. He began to mature him in the faith. Verse 11, he once was useless to you, but now is useful to both you and me. I love this scripture because that was me. I used to be completely useless to anybody, but now I'm useful to Jesus and to the body of Christ. That's such a tremendous blessing. I love that scripture, Philemon um, 111, if you want to give it a one. Verse 12, I sent him back to you. He is my very heart. I really wanted to keep him with me so that on your behalf, he might serve me while I am in chains for the good news. But I didn't want to do anything without your consent so that your goodness wouldn't be by force, but by free will. So Onesimus was Philemon's slave and he ran away from him. And then he went and took refuge with Paul. But Paul is saying that I'm sending Onesimus back because you literally belong to Philemon. It's not right for me to keep you. Okay, so lots of good things there. Verse 15, for perhaps he was separated from you for a while in order that you might have him back forever. No longer as a slave, but more than a slave, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but even more so to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So he's saying maybe it was a good thing that he, you know, left you for a while so that he could be more, become more useful, so that he could grow up, so that he could mature. And that happens sometimes in relationships, you are, you know, you know, you have this immature thing going on and it's not profitable, but then after some separation, you come back together, people have matured, they've learned to serve the Lord, learn to live with their spirit and less with their soul. And then there's a profitable, profitable relationship for the kingdom and also for the parties involved. Verse 17, so if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. But if he has done anything wrong to you or owes you anything, charge it to my account. Supernatural debt cancellation, right? He's taking on the, the offense and the debts of Onesimus because he has raised him up, matured him in the spirit. And he knows that he's worth it now. You know, he may not have been worth it before, but he's worth it now. But Paul is willing to do that. He's saying, charge it to my account. And this is not... Um, uh, just the uh, just the spiritual account. This is the literal account as well. So, you know, so if you've been a slave and you run away, there's a potential that you have cost your owner money or have maybe even stole from them on the way out. And Paul is saying, I'm going to take care of that. I want his slate completely clean. I want his debt wiped out. And who does that sound like? Yeshua. All right, 19. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will repay. Woo-wee. That's like Jesus right? That's like the Lord. He said, vengeance is mine and I will repay. Not to mention that you owe me your very self. Yes, brother, let me have some benefit from you and the Lord. Refresh my heart and Messiah. So um, Paul, like I said, he was Philemon's mentor or whatever before. And so he's saying, you wouldn't be where you are if it weren't for me, you know, because of the work and the investment that I made in you. So you want to be honoring those people who have mentored you, who have brought you up out of the pit, all of those types of things. You know, those people who, you know, they were willing to give of themselves to make sure that you come out in success. They are worthy of honor. 
Having confidence in your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than what I say. At the same time, also prepare a guest room for me, for I hope that through your prayers, I will be given back to you. This is important. You want to pray for those people, um, you know, well, you're supposed to pray for everybody, but you want to pray for those people who have blessed you, who have mentored you, you know, who have prospered you, all of that stuff. Pray for those people. The Lord will answer prayers, you know, for their, for them because of what you've put up there in intercession. Intercession is a powerful, powerful currency in the kingdom of heaven. I'm telling you, you know, we always talk about faith being the main currency. Yes, but intercession is a huge and powerful um, force that's, that's uh, currency in heaven. All right. So you want to be making use of that. But he's saying, pray for me. I hope through your prayers, I'll be given back to you. So Paul, remember, he was always constantly saying, and I hope to be with you soon. I hope to be with you soon. But he was just going through, you know, the Lord had him going through certain places and he didn't always, you know, have the opportunity to go back, but even though he wanted to, and he's saying, well, maybe if you ask the Lord for me, then I'll be able to come back to you for a time, right? Because, you know, the Lord had this plan for him. You're supposed to go here, 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 here. And this is what's supposed to happen to you. And it didn't always involve going back to places where he had, you know, sown seed and blessed the people prior. Verse 23, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Messiah Yeshua greets you. So do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Lucas, my fellow workers. May the grace of our Lord Messiah Yeshua be with your spirit. Amen. And I love that he says, may the grace of our Lord Messiah Yeshua be with your spirit. Amen. Instead of... Um, you know, just with you or with your soul or whatever, because Paul, one of the great things about him and one of the reasons that we get so much revelation and why he was able to write so many, so much of the New Testament is because he had learned to live spirit first. He had learned to step out of that soulish realm and to mature to the point that he was moving in the spirit constantly and consistently. That was the most uh, prominent driving force of his life. It wasn't his emotions. It wasn't, you know, being filtered through the human mind and human will, but he learned to live spirit first and he understood the purpose of uh, releasing a blessing onto your spirit, right? Your a blessing released to your spirit is one thing. A blessing released to your soul or to your body is completely different. That's why one of the reasons, you know, when we're praying, we say we plead the blood of Jesus over a spirit, soul, and body. We want all of these parts of us to come into complete harmony and synchronicity and actually be able to be aligned with the Godhead, aligned with God's will from heaven, and be able to walk that out in our lives, right? So when you get to that place of spiritual maturity where you're living spirit first, it's going to make a difference to you. The blessings and the things that you release. Why? Because you know your soul needs a different blessing than your spirit needs. Your spirit is immediately connected to Holy Spirit by an umbilical cord and your soul has to be sanctified. You're working out your salvation with fear and trembling, right? You're bringing your soul under submission of your spirit and living spirit for it so that you can have that portal of your spirit open wider than the portal of your soul. And then when the Lord is releasing things, you're able to pull them in and bring them in. All right. So let's go ahead and give the Lord some praise. Father, we thank you. We glorify you. We bless you. We magnify you. We honor you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your lessons. We thank you for the men and women of God who have come before us. We thank you for this written word and we thank you and praise you for Yeshua, who is the word made flesh. I'm getting a word here from the Lord. So let me just sit for a minute so I can get it all. I release it to you. Honor my word and the word of the seed planted inside of you will produce the manifestation of the kingdom of God. As my word goes forth, whether it's being read or being delivered, the potential for change in your life is great. Receive the word, believe the word, speak the word, and angels will retrieve the word. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And then there were some other things they seemed to be personally for me, so I didn't to release that. And I will see you next week. God bless you. Hi, this is Zari. If you've enjoyed supping on the Word of God with me today, I invite you to partner with me in this kingdom work. Your partnership in this fertile soil gives you legal access to every anointing my ministry operates in. Multiply, because that's my decree for you. Thank you and be exceedingly blessed in Jesus' name.
Copyright 2022, Zari Banks, Inc.